have to actually start and tell you a couple things. I am challenged by this lecture, actually. And I'll try to tell you why I'm challenged by it. I was challenged putting the slides together. I was challenged by the topic. I was challenged by the interview, which I gave in the exhibit. I'm sure some of you have seen that with the videos that are part of that exhibit experience. And the reason why I'm so challenged is because this is a topic, actually, which is very important to the exhibit and in thinking about the site. But it actually is a situation in which we don't actually have skeletal materials. Okay. So um, how do we interpret that? What do we understand from that? Under what circumstances would something like this occur? These have all been challenging me, actually, for quite a few year, years. And hopefully challenge you too and maybe give you some good ideas that you can bring forward and I'll attempt to um, incorporate or answer whatever it happens to be. So uh, for those of you who are just uh, basically coming in and haven't been to the lecture series thus far, just know that this is one in a series that's associated with the exhibit beneath the surface. And it is about the main burial, okay, that is the focus basically of that exhibit and really of the site, it's Burial 11. It is one of the most intriguing ceremonial burials that I have ever witnessed actually and I have done quite a bit with skeletal material as Steve had said really all over the world. Uh, and this one kind of defies description. I've done things with the Royal Tombs of Ore. Some of you might have been in that exhibit space, also a challenge. But this one, I think, is even beyond that in terms of me really attempting to understand it. Okay. So it is about the skeleton within, and in this case, it's really the skeleton without <laughs> more than it is within. And what we can basically sell or say or say or, or tell basically about this story, which hopefully will be a bit informative to you all when it comes to interpreting the exhibit. And, you know, really thinking about the symbolic nature, essentially, of burials, things of that nature, okay? So, again, for those of you, okay, who are just, you know, sort of thinking about this, it's about the skeletal or lack of skeletal materials from this site, Cidia Conte, okay, in, in, in Panama. I actually give a little bit of a map and also to a drawing rendition of one of the layers of the burial sequence that we're going to begin to discuss. Okay. I will give more detailed information about that, hopefully not too repetitious for you, but just so we can sort of situate our thoughts in, in dealing with this material. Okay. So as you probably all know, the site was actually excavated in a short time frame by Alden Mason in 1940. It was a site that was exposed based on erosion, so water action. It is along a river course and quite close to the ocean. And I say these things because mostly when we don't have skeletons associated with an archaeological site, it's because of highly acidic water, something like that. Uh, and in this particular case, I'm not so convinced that the lack of skeletal materials is indeed associated with that. And again, as we go through, I'll give more and more information about this too. So uh, basically, it is basically a bowl-like burial area that has uh, apparently three sort of skeletal divisions associated with it, a superficial or upper layer, a intermediate or middle layer, and then a lower layer. And yes, okay, supposedly there were skeletons which were located in each one of these areas. The concentration in the archaeology of the time was in the retrieval of the archaeological material, especially the gold, basically, from the site. Okay. In the images that I've seen, okay, we actually have a pretty detailed sort of but sketch-like analysis of the burials themselves. Okay. So we know that there has to have been you know, some essence of them. There are some sites in which, um, you know, we know in the archaeology the soils are very acidic and they call them shadow skeletons. So it's possible that these are shadow skeletons that they're actually imaging or showing. But it's hard for me to actually sort of think or interpret it as being uh, the lack of these skeletons as being associated with highly acidic soils or something like that. And hopefully I'll give you a few insights into that as we kind of go through. There are 23 individuals which were found in this bowl-like excavated base. Okay. 
Uh, the upper layer, eight skeletons were present, okay, or seemingly the ghosts of them were present. The middle layer, um, 12 individuals, two of them actually lying on top of each other, actually are considered to be sort of the main elements of this very elaborate burial pit. And then in a lower layer, three additional individuals were actually present. In terms of their position in the grave, uh, uh, they're all in a position which is also very unusual archaeologically. We do have some situations in which this occurs, but it is indeed unusual. They are face down, okay, in the pit, okay. And there is, a, well, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, in terms of the individual skeletons 15 and 16, one of them seems to be face up. And in the lower layer, there's actually an individual lying on its side. But other than that, they seem to have died, okay? Uh, maybe, uh, you know, at some period of time before they actually constructed the pit. And they were all lined up and laid into this pit, basically face down, okay? When we do encounter any kind of a face down burial, well, maybe let me spend one more moment and I'll show you this in images too. Basically, usually uh, we get, when we have burials, they can be in flex position, like a fetal position. They can be fully extended, generally on the back or side. So in the just rare instances, do we have them sort of face down in the ground, okay? So it isn't sort of super typical, okay? So not only do we have that position, but we actually only have the shadow skeletons which are present. That's presenting us with a bit of a challenge in interpretation, okay? Generally, when we do skeletal analyses, we have lots of different goals in mind, okay? And um, I would love to have these goals in mind. I would like to address each one of these issues and sort of fill out, you know, what is the meaning of this burial and fill out the other parameters that are associated with skeletal analysis. But obviously, lacking the skeletons, it is really virtually impossible to do this, okay? So what I'm going to do is actually emphasize the first case, okay, the mortuary practice assessment, and see if we can't glean or try to understand something about this practice and these peoples based on mortuary practice assessment. Uh, it is indeed the case that when they were originally exposed, the person who was working with Mason, who was working on the skeletal materials, made a claim that he could sex these skeletal shadows and so, at least on the topmost layer, it appears as if all of the individuals are uh, adult males. And he even says older adult males, okay? And he has several of them also, too, in which he makes the statement or case that he can't sex them. I'm unsure, essentially, how he was able to sex them, given the fact that they don't talk about retrieving any particular skeletal materials at all associated with the site. Let me say also, too, just as a bit of a little aside, my personal feeling is that they did have skeletal materials. They just did not excavate them. They might have been super fragmentary, something like that. Uh, it is the case that often when we have very fragmentary skeletal materials, if you're working on a really, really tight time schedule, it's almost impossible to devote the energy actually to retrieving them. And I'll show you some situations uh, that have that particular condition associated with them. So it basically means that if you're working very quickly at a site, especially in the past, this would happen all of the time, the skeletal materials are, uh, you know, broken, fragmentary, difficult to remove. So what they'll do is just sort of glance over them. They'll, you know, take them out, but basically do very little recording on them and certainly not preserve them and bring them back to a museum. The other materials were returned to the museum, just no skeletal materials. Uh, there are adjacent sites, actually, that have been excavated more recently than Cidio Conte. And those sites actually do have skeletal materials associated with them, and they're in very similar environments as this site, which really kind of makes me think that uh, they, you know, maybe retrieved it, maybe they were put in a museum, set aside, put in a shed, these kinds of things happen all the time with skeletal materials, and just never retrieved or noted, something like that. Okay. And I say this because at the site there are animal bones. Okay. So if indeed, you know, the situation was such that the soils were hyperacidic, we shouldn't have any animal bones, basically, okay? 
uh, because animal bone is composed of the exact same material as human bone. Uh, and if there is going to be a situation in which these acids actually dissolve the mineral component of bone, it wouldn't have preferentially just done it to the human material. It would have to have done it to the animal material as well. So there you go. It just seems like it's, you know, one of these historic issues that is involved in this, and it's not really the reality that there were no skeletons there. In terms of the processes of decomposition, what happens after death, and this is in some, some measure actually relatively well understood and worked out, especially in the early changes that are associated with what happens to an individual after death. There is a series of early post-mortem changes. There are things like temperature changes, things like that, you know, blood pooling, all of those early changes are well identified with the time sequence. There's late post-mortem changes. This is when the body begins to decompose primarily internally through basically bacteria that are mostly associated in the gut. Okay. They break out of the gut. They begin to ingest a lot of the, the organ mass and the soft tissues. And then, of course, you have all of those intrusive things coming from outside, insect material, worms, all of those sorts of things. They're going to serve, obviously, to decompose the soft tissues of the body relatively quickly. So then once we're beginning this sort of stage, okay, of real decomposition, basically uh, a whole series of things can happen and intervene in this stage, essentially, of decomposition. Uh, you first, of course, start to have the body, and they actually call it putrefaction, okay? This is where, you know, you really have almost like a sort of a soupy-like condition associated with the uh, materials, okay? In some cases, the materials don't completely decompose, especially in individuals who have a high body fat composition or found in alkaline environments, mostly associated with, uh, with the sea, found or dumped in the sea, something like this, okay? where the fat tissue actually forms a particular material, which is called adipocere. There are situations in which uh, there's only partial decomposition of the body, and those are the processes which actually lead to mummification. And although there's this idea that mummification is a relatively rare phenomenon, it occurs in many places all around the world. Mummies have been found on every continent. Um, and they have been found in hot, dry conditions, cold, damp conditions, I mean, pretty much everything. So you can't make a broad statement that mummification occurs in a, you know, just a very small number of environments. It's really not true. Most of the time, of course, it moves away from the loss of all soft tissue to skeletonization. Okay. And then, especially in acidic soils, where the mineral composition of the bone is actually basically uh, melted okay, away, okay. you can have complete dissolution of all of the skeletal elements as well. Okay. But you know, most of the time we're retrieving something okay, associated with these ancient burials in an archaeological context because of course it's one of the primary directives associated with archaeology to find these materials. Okay. In any event, okay, we also know a bit about the time frame when most of these things take place and it's relatively quick. Okay. Uh, going to skeletonization, depending on the environment. You can have an individual in some environment skeletonized in a week or less, okay? So it's not like, you know, it takes, you know, a particular long period of time to have these processes occur. It's much quicker than you might think. Burial actually uh, slows the decomposition process. So, you know, basically uh, you reduce, especially if you're digging or putting something deep in the earth, you reduce the number of external elements that are going to be able to sort of take part or eat those, you know, the soft tissues which are present. But basically, okay, the process, okay, of going from a living person to a person in one of these contexts can indeed be quite quick, okay. So you can see skeletonization in a closed structure, 14 days to three years. Um, in open structures, it's usually a bit less, okay. Um, but again, I probably, well, really, I should mention here, there are so many micro kind of environmental conditions which will actually alter some of this time frame that it's hard to say anything that's really, you know, completely stable, okay? Uh, and, you know, uh, and the thing is that most of this kind of data has been derived for forensics because, of course, these are the people who 
oftentimes they're dealing with uh, legal cases, missing persons, and things like this, and they need to really estimate these kinds of time frames. So burial usually reduces all of this, okay, in terms of time frame, just so you know, okay, not always, but often. Whenever it comes to burials, okay, it's very hard to really understand the micro environments of those burials. So, you know, we sometimes make very broad sweeping statements about the pH of the soils, maybe whether or not there is water inundation, whether or not they're waterlogged. Okay. But, you know, in fact, we would really have to sort of take note of every square inch of these burials to give a real sort of a, sort of a real full-blown understanding of all of the factors, okay, which are involved in this process. Okay. I did one time do something absolutely crazy, and to this day, I can't believe I did this. I was teaching at Bryn Mawr College until 2002, and me and my students buried two baboons on Bryn Mawr College campus. Okay. And, you know, just thinking, well, let's see what happens when we bury baboons there. And we, two of my students did it as a senior thesis project. It's, you know, I didn't know it at the time how illegal it was to do this. But now, of course, I know it, and it's too late to sort of, you know, recover from it. But after years, okay, of going and digging up, okay, these baboons, we found that they were not decomposing, actually, uh, well at all. Uh, when we were digging them up, of course, you know, we were you know, taking notes and doing photographs and all of this. And our last sort of unearthing was probably five years after the burial, and we still had soft tissue, we still had all the fur of the baboons, okay. Uh, we were nowhere close to being down to the skeletal elements, so, you know, you really can't, you know, make these sort of big blanket statements when it comes to how long these processes actually occur. And it smelled bad for a very long time when I say that. I mean, every time we were going out there, it's going like, oh, no, I can't believe I have this, because it's not a good smell. Any of you have smelled decomposed um, materials like this know that it's probably one of the worst smells you could possibly smell. Okay. Anyway, um, adipose here, no one really knows why it occurs. Okay, this is basically a situation that we see a lot in water environments, okay, but we can also see in just environments that are sort of normal, okay, in terms of disposal of the dead. And in this particular case, we're looking at a youngster who was buried about 50 years ago or so, they disinterred the body, opened the coffin, and she looked basically like she had died yesterday, okay. Uh, yes, of course, we have processes of embalming that really, you know, keep the soft tissue intact for longer periods of time, but in this particular case, it was the fat tissue of the body, and of course, fat content is very high in children that allow for this kind of preservation. Water environments, very common, actually, to alter this course of losing tissue and going to skeletonization. And that's, of course, why forensic people very oftentimes don't like dealing with any remains that are actually taken out of water environments because it's very hard to estimate what's called the PMI, the post-mortem interval, the time frame uh, in which the person died. Okay. So it happens, okay, it is probably one of the most interesting kinds of processes. For those of you who have gone to the Mütter Museum, you probably are familiar with the soap lady, okay, because they sometimes say that this fat tissue turns to soap, and that's, of course, the name that has been associated with a lot of adipocere remains, okay. We also give frozen bodies. I mean, this is um, uh, not a super common occurrence. Uh, this happens to be... Uh, George Mallory, who actually was found many years, 75 years after his death, okay, on Mount Everest, okay. So, yep, we can get frozen remains. Utsi, the Iceman, some of you might have heard of in the Alps, okay. When they first came upon him, they thought he was a forensics case. He looked that sort of fresh and new, okay, basically like he had died yesterday. Uh, the materials that he was found with were their indication that he wasn't a recently dead person, but in fact, they sort of thought about that for a very long time before they actually considered the antiquity of that particular individual. Okay. Mummification occurs all of the time as well, and in, as I said, a lot of different conditions. I actually show this because hopefully you're all sort of Philadelphians. Some of you might remember in 1960s radical in Philadelphia, Ira Einhorn. They extradited him from France. Actually, he was uh, found guilty of murder of his girlfriend, Holly Maddox, and had fled uh, a long while before um, 
uh, well, I fled quite close to the time of finding of her body, actually. He was going to be arrested and put on trial, and he fled to England, subsequently moved from England, married a Swedish woman, and was living in France. In any event, okay, he had taken the body of Holly Maddox okay, and put her in a trunk in the closet okay, in Pelton Village, and she mummified completely. Okay. And I've worked on cases, forensic cases in Philadelphia, where the person has not decomposed, okay, has just mummified in an attic or a basement or something like this. So it isn't a super kind of a rare occurrence. Okay. We do get things like uh, preservation in uh, highly acidic environments. And I was talking about the Cita Conte uh, uh, burial and talking about acidic environments and preservation. And I had said they're not very conducive to preservation. In the iron pans of some of the northern parts of Europe and peat bogs, basically, they do have um, uh, conditions in which people are preserved. Okay, so this is basically just two examples that I'm showing here, and they look, of course, like you know, sort of complete people. The interesting thing about bog people is, and again, because of this highly acidic component to it, there are no skeletons on the inside, okay? The skeletons are actually completely destroyed, okay? The iron pan actually preserves the soft tissue, okay, of the body, and you can see that these are indeed looking like they had died yesterday in the sense that they, you can see the individual features of the face and things like this, okay. And then, of course, now we've moved to plastination. <laughs> and so, of course, I always have to show this is a little bit of a smiley kind of a fun thing. And this is where the body is infused with plastics, okay, under pressure. And, of course, that can serve to preserve something basically forever, okay. I've heard some people are now opting to have themselves plastinated, okay. Embalming, however, okay, is also serving a function of preserving tissues for a longer period of time. Depending on how well people are embalmed, they can last for a really long time. They've disinterred Abraham Lincoln, and he looks like he died yesterday, basically, if you see any images of that. And the very interesting thing about Abraham Lincoln is when they disinterred him, they were actually wanting to do a genetic test on him. And when they disinterred him, he was entirely black which I always said he probably would have enjoyed. <laughs> but he looked like Abraham Lincoln. It was actually kind of amazing. Anyway, let's go back to Cidio Conte and sort of give you a little bit of a sense of what we can tell and what we can't tell. And uh, I hopefully represent a bit of my frustration associated with this. Okay. So the top layer, we actually see these eight individuals that it were drawn okay, at the time in which they were exposed okay, in a decent amount of detail. Okay. So if they were shadow people, okay, it was quite an excellent shadow of these individuals' bodies okay, as they were lying there. Okay. You can see that they're all lying in a nice organization with each other. They're not randomly thrown in. We know that in a lot of these sort of symbolic burials, okay, the bodies are positioned in particular ways. Okay, there's obviously a meaning that's associated with this. The problem in, it, in, Cid in Cidio Conte is that we're not exactly sure what the frame is of all of this. We don't have the uh, ethnographic information that allows us to do a full interpretation of this. Okay? And they are indeed all face down. Okay? It's the second layer, which is the one which is chock full, basically, of um, archaeological objects, okay, including ceramics. There are um, um, uh, animal teeth, primarily, okay, probably ornamentation of particular sorts, as well as the bulk of the gold was located at this layer. Okay. It's the two center individuals that have been the focus of attention. Okay. Uh, we also see that in this particular case, in this part of the bowl, maybe there was a requisite number of people that had to fit into the space. I'm not really too sure. Uh, but we've got two bodies actually sort of shoved okay, at the foot and at the head end okay, of, the, of the vast bulk of individuals who are lying in the pit. Uh, why, you know, this particular arrangement, we also have two bodies basically on one body on top of another body. It may be, you know, something associated with the dimensions, okay, of the actual grave outline itself, something like that, unsure. Uh, the thinking is that the person in the center 
is the person who is the main focus, essentially, of the burial, probably a head person of some sort, whatever that means in terms of this culture. We sometimes translate that maybe to something like a chief. Okay, sometimes they call people in this area at the time uh, in a chieftain, okay, kind of social organization, very sort of Western way of thinking about it. And I'm not sure it's a good interpretation here, but it seems as if that person was the focus essentially of this grave, okay, at least based on the number of objects, okay, which are associated with the individual. I don't have a good rendition of the lowest layer, okay, uh, they don't really nicely sort of lay out the outline in any of these sort of sketches or drawings, okay, as they do on the two top layers, okay, and so I'm just really going to kind of concentrate on the individuals in these two layers, at least as best as I can, okay. Uh, in the bottom layer, uh, the center individual, remember there's just three, is lying on uh, his or her side, okay? And the other two are actually face down, okay? Almost always when you're looking at face down burials that have been described in the archaeological literature, they are in a position of um, lack of a better way to put it, or at least the way it's been interpreted, disgrace. Okay, sometimes enemies are placed in that position, okay. And I'll show you some images of some of these things too, which I've actually just pulled off the internet, okay. As I say, it's not that it is super, super rare, but it's relatively rare. There have been about 600 burials that have been described as being face down, okay. Um, and the ones that I'm going to show, I'm bringing more out for the drama of it than anything else, have been interpreted as vampire graves, okay, just for the heck of it, okay. So, you know, there's something, okay, that's going on with these people and that, uh, it, and their burial position, okay, or their mortuary assessment is associated with some kind of a, a some, some kind of a, uh, of a dis in this case, I wouldn't say with vampires it's a disgrace, okay, but it is with the power of those individuals and tapping it or holding it down, okay. And so we do have a lot of images, okay. uh, probably a lot of you know if you're sort of interested in the site, this was one of the first sites that there was active photographic recording, so there's quite a bit of archaeological material. Uh, Mason was an excellent archaeologist, other parts of the site were excavated by uh, the Peabody Museum, okay, which I've been told, that I said it wrong, it's Peabody, okay, the Peabody Museum, okay. <sighs> Anybody with, I'm now like anytime anybody uses it says Peabody, I'm going like, oh, please shut up. Okay. <laughs> at the Peabody Museum at Harvard, they recommended Mason do the excavation in 1940. Okay, so there's much material from that area also at the Peabody Museum okay, at Harvard. <laughs> and uh, the photographic uh, images are actually really quite nice. I mean, uh, Mason was an excellent archaeologist. He's actually described as a very excellent all-round anthropologist as people had been through really the middle part of the 20th century. Now we get sort of super specialized people, but in his time he was very good as an archaeologist, also as a cultural anthropologist. So he was accumulating a lot of information. Obviously he was very interested in the goings on there. There was a person brought on board for the analysis of the bone, but I haven't actually seen any good description of these uh, shadow people. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, okay, that um, the person himself was actually a trained skeletal person or not, okay, maybe been a sort of minimally trained. It always is the case nowadays whenever you're working at an archaeological site with a lot of human remains that you'll almost always work with a skeletal person who is really mostly an expert, okay, in the field. And it's because they can extract a bit more information even from really fragmentary remains, okay. I wish, you know, someone had been there to do a, even a basic description I think would have been worthwhile. So here's the shadow, okay. So this has been intriguing me actually for a long time. For those of you who again know the, um, know the exhibit, okay, it was curated by Clark Erickson, a person who is very active in the Americas in archaeology. And he asked me like sort of personally how I thought about this or interpreted it, and that of course was the genesis of that uh, small segment which is in the exhibit itself. 
And I looked at it and, you know, sometimes ideas sort of pop in your head. Sometimes you kind of go off on a particular track and then one of my students is here and I'm frequently talking to the students, what do you think about this? How does this work? And in this particular case, I couldn't fall on anything that was a good explanation. Okay. So this is why I call them shadow graves. And we do have these at a number of sites. The reason why I'm unwilling, and we know that the grave was inundated with water, okay, close to the sea, usually it's alkaline seawater. Why acidic like this? Okay. But I can't fall into that particular descriptive mode, mostly because of the intact, not even fragmentary, presence of animal materials, okay? So there'd be no way preferentially we would be able to retain the animals, okay, and not have anything associated with the humans, okay? I've heard people say maybe it was, you know, something associated with the way the bodies were actually decomposing, the animals were not in close proximity to those bodies, but there um, seemed to be ornamentation, like necklaces, so they would have indeed been close to the body, on the body, in the body, okay, those sorts of things. So I, I just don't get it, okay. Uh, and you can see nicely, okay, that the outlines are present, okay, you can even see the details of the vertebral column. And I'm gonna show you some images of some things that uh, even with Paul excavated in Kenya that you can see are difficult actually to see and maybe it's that, you know, similar kind of condition, but they just didn't put in the time actually to extract those materials, okay. So, okay. Uh, this is actually from Malvern. <laughs> I knew I would get to Malvern, actually. <laughs> and it looks like nothing, you know, like you're looking at it again, like, oh, there's nothing there, okay. There actually, okay, is the outline, okay, and eventually, okay, we were able to, you see, you see what I mean, like it's hard to see, okay. And actually, the reason why the trowel is sitting there is really for size, okay. But we knew we had hit a burial, okay. But you can see that, you know, you might miss something like this, okay, especially if it was something that you didn't necessarily want to spend a lot of time on or didn't want to concentrate on. And it was actually this skull, okay. So, and the materials from Duffy's Cut were indeed found in acidic soil. They're only a couple hundred years old, okay. And the preservation is poor, essentially, at the site, okay. So, but we still have bone elements. We have nothing like complete skeletons, okay, but we still have bone elements and there's a lot of translation that we can do of this, okay. So it, you know, really demands a strategy for extracting things like this, okay. And indeed, you could have one person devote an entire day to pull out a pretty scrappy looking skeleton and clearly they uh, didn't want to devote the time to doing something like that. You also, too, okay, might know, okay, they exhibit upstairs, um, on the royal tombs of Ur, ancient Iraq, okay. Uh, this is actually a scattering of bones in the royal tomb. And it doesn't look like much, okay. And actually the excavator of that site, okay, uh, Woolley chose not to excavate these skeletal materials, but he did take a few samples out, okay, which are actually on exhibit upstairs, okay. And for those of you who follow a bit about the museum, we located two other skeletons that he had, we had found, basically, that had been um, not numbered in uh, collections over the course of the last couple of uh, years or so. And those, okay, basically were what really token elements that he had brought out because he couldn't excavate all the skeletons that he had come down upon, okay. So this is actually, but you know, in this case, it's sort of a scattering of bones, okay. And uh, when we go through a little bit better, okay, you'll be able to see the details of this, I think, um, a little bit more fully. The reconstruction, which was done at the time, okay, and again, it was a, a really um, the death in all likelihood of a king or queen, and all of the servants which were associated with that king or queen were actually brought into the tomb, okay, arranged, okay, and then, of course, you know, 
uh, were eventually exposed and excavated by Woolley. This is a reconstruction of the movement into the tomb, had an entrance gay, and then, you know, sort of marched down into this pit. And then the top of the, and all the material at the top of the pit were actually collapsed gay into the pit, thus sort of crushing, but nevertheless actually preserving the material. Okay. And this is, of course, the reconstruction of what happened to those individuals after they were marched into the pit. There were animals okay, and humans, okay, and they were arranged basically almost sort of um, uh, uh, in a like spoon-like position, all of them up against each other like this. Um, not easy to excavate by any means, okay, but because of the importance of this and because, again, of the gold associated with it, Woolley brought back okay, the two heads, which are actually on exhibit upstairs. We call them the dead heads okay, from the royal tombs. Okay. And the identification, of course, of the beautiful gold and lapis that are associated with those two. Okay. Swash completely flat. Okay. Because the uh, talk is not specifically about ore. You, uh, and, you know, it, I, I've given talks in the museum about ore before. The skulls are probably about an inch thick, something like that, okay? To get any detail on those, we've CT scanned and done a number of things and came to the conclusion that those individuals were probably dead well before, okay? Uh, they were put into this burial place, okay? And in all likelihood, rather than drinking poison, as Woolley had suggested, and then lying down in this death position, they probably were bludgeoned to death, okay, and smoked, okay, over the course of many years, okay, and then arranged in the tomb with the king, in the case of this particular group that we have here at the Penn Museum of the Queen. So, but still, you can imagine, this sort of scrappy looking thing in there has yielded a, quite a bit of information. So even though we're not picking up those 70 odd individuals that are in the pit, okay, uh, with um, Queen, uh, we still were able to get a lot of information just from the two that were retained, okay. Um, believe it or not, we found this skeleton in uh, collections over the summertime. And you can see how it's difficult actually to make out. When we found it, okay, also from ore from a deeper level, not at the royal tombs, you can see how scary it actually looks if you were thinking about excavating it out of the ground. What uh, Woolley did is, okay, he dug under it, okay, basically, and wound up putting it on a board, covering it with wax, and then bringing it out of the ground and shipping it first to Britain and then uh, to the Penn Museum. But you can see, and it represents for us here in the museum, a challenge, okay? We're probably not gonna take this out of the material that it's sitting in, okay? Uh, because we believe, well, honestly, we don't know how to take it out, okay? I mean, we would destroy more than we would actually be able to retrieve, okay? Uh, we did, okay, use to take uh, the first skeleton that we found also from or to conservation, and they had it in their conservation lab on the third floor, and they just to take the wax off of it, okay? And that took four months, okay? And it wasn't taken out of the rock hard breccia that it was actually sitting in, uh, and exposed and gave us some nice detail about that individual, but you know, the labor intensive, okay, effort that it would have taken to do this. And we're not so sure how we would preserve it even when we got it out. Didn't seem like it was all that worthwhile to do. Actually, maybe, you know, it's the thing to save for the future. Okay. So let's look at what some of these skeletons look like when they're in the ground. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been at archaeological sites. Some of you might have been, okay, and actually attempted to excavate skeletons or have seen skeletons in the field. But it always is a challenge to think about how we're going to extract these, okay? And there are some excellent people, okay? They just, you know, really have developed techniques over the course of their own lifetime to excavate skeletons effectively. And it is indeed quite a, an astounding skill to be able to do that, okay? So this is actually a site, okay, that um, is in East Africa, okay? And it's one of these sites that is, um, on the coast of East Africa, of Kenya, and it is associated with uh, the early Swahili people. So these are Islamic burials, okay? 
and the individuals are all buried on their side, okay, and also too with the head facing east, okay, all of these kinds of things which are associated with Islamic burials, okay. But, uh, so, of course, you get a sense of the importance of the burial position associated with this, okay, so that's the mortuary assessment. We know that they're Islamic, okay. But really what I want to show you here, okay, is not so much that component to it, okay, but the fact that, okay, this individual in the center is killer, okay, but is lying directly on top of another skeleton which is peeking out from underneath it, okay. And so you see how difficult it is, okay, and of course com further compression, okay, has made this a better preserved individual than this one is down here, okay. And so you can see how it would be maybe something that you could outline. I mean, obviously you can see that it's there, but to actually remove it from the ground in any kind of an intact way would be a, a super large challenge, okay. Another view of the same thing, okay. So how did we know that individual was there, okay? Because somewhat more superficial were the lower leg elements of that individual, okay. Then began to clean it off and scrape it off and saw more and more of the body underneath, okay. We also find, okay, that in a lot of the excavations and people often are, you know, describing mortuary context based on the position of bodies, but when things are in the ground, they frequently get moved around, changed, altered, these sorts of things, okay. So in that very same site where we saw all these Islamic burials, okay, we've got one individual, okay, and this is the back of the individual's head who's face down, okay. And it's not because the individual was buried face down, but because of maybe the way the earth was actually put on top of the body as they were closing the grave, okay, whatever it happens to be. Rather than staying nicely sort of situated on the side, okay, he pitched over, okay, and actually is found basically face down in the dirt, okay. So you have to be careful when you do these things, okay, that you're looking contextually at everything also too, okay. With the case of City Ocante, obviously, okay, they're buried face down. But I wonder, you know, basically about shifting elements, at least on some of the other skeletons. Not their position within the grave, but in the ones that are on the side, maybe face up. I don't know if that is something that is um, part of the original burial or is associated with just being in the ground, okay, for a long period of time, okay. We get all kinds of stuff, okay, basically, based on the history of excavations and more information, uh, we now can understand a bit better. So you can see three skulls sort of peeking out here, okay. This is at the same site that we looked at these uh, individual burials from, okay. So what's that, okay. If you go up to um, uh, the exhibit uh, on the third floor that actually is, oh, It's the biblical one, okay. Canaan in ancient Israel. Oh my God, don't tell anybody that I forgot the name of an exhibit. <laughs> and we even have a burial in that exhibit. Where am I doing? I mean, I have to go home and go to bed, okay. <laughs> like, so, uh, you actually can see, okay, because we have so much information, the context on that is so cool because you've got the main burial in the center, but because of restrictions basically in land, okay, they, for burials, okay, they have the main one in the center and then they pushed, okay, the other individuals that occupied the tomb to the side, it's called a reduction. This is a reduction in the same tradition which is present in the, in the Middle East, okay. And one of the skulls that we pulled out, okay, basically it's a pancake head, okay, but we still got a lot of information basically associated with it. Okay, so let's do a bit on mortuary practice for a moment or two. And this brings up some of my favorite slides in the city of Philadelphia associated with mortuary practice. And this is the plaque in the cemetery at Old Swedes Church, okay. So it's not just about getting rid of the dead, okay, it's all of the spiritual elements which are associated with the dead, okay. So that's why I uh, put it here because, of course, it's not just, you know, how do you put a person in the ground, it is what this is serving to do and what messages that it's serving the community actually to receive. Okay. And my favorite gravestone actually in the area is this one. I had to show it. It's a little irrelevant, but you'll see that it has, you know, and all these traditions, okay, 
a lot of individual presence actually comes out also too. So this is a traditional burial, okay, and of course with a great deal of humor, okay. Uh, I restrained basically from bringing out one of them, which is actually a burial in the, it's in the city of Philadelphia that has a gravestone, okay, and on both sides of it are parking meters, okay, and the person was a parking attendant, okay, and it said time has run out. Okay, there's a lot of great things like this. There's a lot of art actually associated with burials. Okay, if you go to Laurel Hill Cemetery, a famous Philadelphia uh, announcer, okay, is buried actually on a hillside overlooking actually the um, uh, Schuylkill River. And uh, there are stands, okay, basically from the old um, veteran stadium that actually line his grave. So a lot of information can be gotten from burials about and their symbolic nature of these things. Okay. We also too have a lot of symbolic things associated with death that don't actually have burials associated with them, which is also an interesting sort of um, kind of a, an add-on, you know, basically to this whole experience. And I was just asking Paul for Paul. Uh, I was going over the Walnut Street Bridge, and there's actually a memorial on the bridge, okay, in the middle of the bridge, apparently for a student who had died when a car had lost control. And then he, realizing the car was lo losing control, had climbed a lamppost, okay, and the car hit the lamppost, and the lamppost bent over, okay, and he was thrown, I think, actually into the river, which was right, it could have been on the railroad tracks, I'm not sure, but right underneath it. So you get all kinds of things which are associated with that. You see memorials all over the place. My favorite thing in France, okay, I don't know that they still do this, on a lot of the rural roads where people would be speeding, everywhere a person died on the road, they had a silhouette cutout, okay, of the person, actually, okay. So these are all, you know, basically, in that case, it's not super a memorial, but it's like a warning, actually, okay, for people that are traveling too quickly on the road, okay. We've had a lot of changes, actually, just in the last hundred years, and I mention this because there's, it's almost impossible, okay, to extract the depth of information from some of these ancient graves, okay, because, of course, so much of culture and tradition are involved with, um, with burial, okay. And I show this one, which is really kind of cool, because, of course, some of you might know that the parlor, okay, in the house, okay, was the place, uh, never heated, was the place where they show dead relatives, basically, okay. And so, of course, we've completely altered the, you know, sort of the context of that room in the house, okay. Uh, funeral homes are still called funeral parlors, okay. And that's the, sort of the origin of the word. But, of course, we've got the history and tradition that allows us to do these kinds of reconstructions, okay. Burials, symbolic, whatever, are deep in the history of humans, okay? So, of course, being a human evolution person, I'm always really kind of talking about this depth, okay, to symbolism associated with burial. So, obviously, okay, we're, we're, we're talking about sort of a deep tradition, okay, in human populations that take a lot of different kinds of forms, okay? Uh, this, I'm not so sure, is a symbolic burial, but it's also kind of cool. It goes to a site in the north central part of Spain near the city of Burgos, okay, and the site is called Atapuerca, where there is a pit at the back of the cave where these people lived, okay, where they would take their dead relatives, friends or whatever, and chuck them down into, okay. And in the pit, there's some animal bones, but there's nothing else in the pit, okay. So even though it's like sort of tossing something out, okay, it's an exclusive place of tossing something out, which might have, you know, some importance associated with it. So it looks kind of willy-nilly, but it could be symbolic in some way. Uh, we have other symbolic or things that have been interpreted as symbolic burials in prehistory. This one goes back about 50,000 years to Neanderthal times. And then by the time we get a lot of these early modern peoples in Europe, we have super symbolic burials. Okay. Again, very hard to interpret. Some of them are even mass burials. This one is amazing. It's from a site in what is now the, um, uh, the Czech Republic. Okay. The site is Shed Mosty, and this individual is buried with a lot of ornaments, basically clothing, ornaments, and probably also jewelry. 
and the body is arched over with mammoth tusks and mammoth shoulder blades and covered in red okra. I mean, so obviously this is, you know, super important day associated with these people from the past. Okay. This is the burial ground of Old Swedes Church, okay? So we're taking burials that go back basically to the late 1700s or so, okay? And the reason why I show it is because, okay, not only do you see the loss of information on the individual tombstones, okay, but quite common in these burial situations, you have this sort of buildup of the mass of the earth, so it looks like the stones are swallowed, okay? And so, of course, then you start to get this kind of interesting sort of layering kind of an effect, okay? This church, okay, basically is still used today, so obviously they're interested in the burial ground and they spend a lot of time keeping and maintaining the burial ground, but even with that, you start to see it changing. I mean, the landscape, okay, of this Christian burials keep altering or changing, okay. Uh, if you go to Woodland Cemetery, you can see some amazing okay, burial uh, information and art. Okay. Some of you might know the Gross Clinic, the famous paintings by Aikens. Both Gross and Aikens are buried at Woodland Cemetery. And then, of course, I'm actually showing this as a little peek. Okay. See the word Disney? Okay. Uh, actually, I want to show you. Ah, did I screw this up? Ah, ah, it didn't come out. I had a great monument actually in there that I took from a cemetery in uh, Northeast Philadelphia. And this says Disney, okay, and it's a monument. Oh, I know where I have it in the slides. I'm sorry, because I've just screwed this up a little bit. And the monument in the cemetery at the top, it's the Disneys, okay, and the monument is to their family who married, okay, into the family of the Mousies. I mean, it's not possible or what, you know what I mean? And it's a cremation, I should put it in the set with the cremation, okay. Uh, Duffy's Cut, okay, we actually buried in a mass grave, basically, all of those individuals that we found when we excavated uh, <coughs> that place in Malvern, Pennsylvania, very symbolic. The at top of this was actually topped with a Celtic cross, okay, in memory of the people. We returned one of the people to their family in Ireland, okay. So a lot of this sort of history and tradition is present, okay. Uh, in Woodland Cemetery, we also have mass graves like this one, which was the move cemetery material from the Blockley Alms House okay, to this area. They decided to accept it. It's in a mass grave there. This is an Etruscan group of burial tombs, okay, so you can see some amazing information associated with burials, okay. It is indeed the case that most archaeology comes from tombs and graves, okay. So, um, you know, we may or may not be concentrating on the skeletons, but because people buried things like this, they have a tendency to have that lasting power of time, okay. Lots of other kinds of symbolism, hard to understand for those of you who've been in Rome. You might recognize, actually, the capuchin monkeys. Uh, monkeys, <laughs> they are monkeys. But the capuchin, <laughs> capuchin monks <laughs> that supposedly wore a, a headdress that made them look like capuchin monkeys. That's why they're called this. Okay. And these weird rituals which are associated with that. Okay. And then, of course, we've got cremains. We actually extract a lot of information from cremains also, too. So this is an ancient cremain. Okay. And, uh, you know, basically you can see the sort of the bigger sort of chunks of bone and things like this, okay. And we have ancient cremains in the past also too, okay, so a lot of pots and things like this that'll have cremains present, okay. Uh, this supposedly, I don't know, some of you might know this better than me, is the Obamas actually throwing the ashes, okay, of mom in Hawaii into the ocean. So you get a lot of sort of symbolic representations like this. Uh, cremains, okay, actually are interesting because people do a lot of different things with cremains. This came out of a modern crematoria. A lot of people don't know that a lot of those materials are actually processed, okay, into a dirt or something like that. Generally speaking, cremains are kind of chunky. But we do get a lot of burnings, okay, of individuals and preserving individuals using, um, using a, almost like a kind of a smoking, okay. There's our Disney outfit. And I remember why I switched this, and it's because this is an urn, it's cremains, okay. And yeah, I, I thought this had to have been a joke, but then the other little plaque that you saw was for one of the Disneys, actually, which is close one, okay. 
I did promise yeah, that I would show you some of these um, materials associated with what are called vampire burials. Okay. Uh, you'll see desecrations of bodies and things like this. In this particular case, the head was actually removed and placed between the knees, but there's lots of other things which have been done basically and have been interpreted as being um, uh, ways of burying a person to make them lose respect in some way. Okay. So this is an upside down burial actually in um, Romania. Okay. And because of course this is the place in the world that has the mist associated with vampires, okay, it's been interpreted as a vampire burial and there's actually quite a few like this. And then of course other interpretations uh, and other ways of doing this this is a skull with a brick in its mouth, okay, putting something in the mouth, essentially, of these individuals, also considered to be a way of disrespecting the individual, okay. Skeletal material are, are difficult to actually, when you bring them out of the ground, to sort, okay, to clean, and actually to derive information on. And this is one of our students working at a huge medieval cemetery that yielded probably something on the order of 400 skeletal individuals. Um, outside of Rome. Uh, it is a time intensive kind of a process. Okay. In terms of the assessment, and I have so many regrets that we weren't able to actually at least have a couple little bits and fragments associated with the Silvio Conte people, because even a tooth can be hugely informative. Okay. So I'll go through a couple of things which would have been great. Okay. If they just kept little fragments, we might have been able to age and sex the individuals, okay, which would have given us much more of a hint, not only to the people in life, but maybe to the rituals associated with the burial process. Okay. So we're saying that they're all males. Okay. I even said that they were all older males, but we're really trusting that person and looking at these, what they're calling sort of shadow burials. Okay. It's a, we could do a, 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 a DNA analysis, okay, and actually maybe even say if the individuals were related to each other, okay. Uh, we can even do that by on some skeletal elements, and I'll show you some of this too. So even, you know, if um, you know, it wasn't possible to fully excavate the skeletal materials, I almost sound like I'm... Um, um, you know, begging you to do things in case you go into the fields archaeologically. But even if you can only save a skull or a tooth or something like this, it can, it can give us quite a bit of info. Okay. Uh, demographics okay, of these things coming from aging and sexing. This actually comes from uh, that same site in Kenya. Okay. And it's interesting because, and we don't understand why, we have so many young people actually present in the tombs which were found at this site on the Kenyan coast. Okay. Generally speaking, when you have a lot of youngsters okay, that are associated with a site or a cemetery with a lot of youngsters, the chances are really high. It's what's called a catastrophic sequence. Okay. That is that it's associated with a, um, a, a major tragedy of some sort, a flood, something like that. Okay. Um, it can also just be the accidental death of a number of individuals. I mean, under you know any any kind of conditions, an earthquake, a tornado, something like this. We know based on um, the situation during the tsunami in in, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Okay, and even though we knew it didn't represent the population at the area in the area at the t at the time. Okay, but of the two hundred thousand plus people that were killed. Okay. Over a third of them were kids, okay? And normally, you know, when you're getting an attritional cemetery, it's a very different kind of a situation. You mostly have older individuals, okay? So the paleo demographics of it would have been sort of super interesting, okay? Uh, even, again, as I say, a tooth, okay? This is the second molar of an individual that has open roots, okay? We would be able to precisely age, okay, that individual if even the tooth actually had been retained, okay? Older individuals frequently have in modern populations, okay, that are based essentially on agricultural products like corn as they would have probably been at Studio Conte. We have a lot of tooth loss, so this is actually a lower jaw showing you the loss of the molar, molar sequence associated with cavities and probably infection, maybe, maybe periodontal disease would have been super informative to have. If we have even like a goodly measure or part of the pelvis, okay, it is quite easy 
actually to sex the individual based on that. Okay. So this is actually the front of the pelvis, the pubic bone. There's the pubic bone on this individual. Very, very hard to get out of this accumulated sediment, but that would have, of course, been the thing that sealed the deal in talking about these all as male. Okay. We can tell what people did in life, you know, basically based on markers of the, on the skeleton associated with muscle packages. Okay. So uh, this is the border okay, of the scapula right in the armpit. Okay. We know what muscles attach on there. Okay. And so, of course, we then understand that these individuals were associated with very particular kinds of activities associated with those muscles. Okay. Uh, this is also uh, from the site of, um, on the Kenyan coast. And a lot of the markings on the back of the pelvis are for the gluteal muscles, the big butt muscles. Okay. They seem to have been involved in a lot of activities that would have been associated with bending okay, and then rising up. Okay. These kinds of things are associated in large measure with the gluteals. A lot of balancing features with the gluteals. It sort of would have been super helpful. This is actually the femur bone, okay, showing ruts or, or rivets, okay, that are associated with the scraping of the patella over the knee, okay. So we can see arthritic changes, okay, occupational changes that are associated with the skeleton. Uh, we can tell diseases, okay. So this is actually a case of mastoiditis, okay, an, a, an intense and long-term infection, okay, basically of the ear that nowadays, of course, we would treat with antibiotics so people don't really show these kinds of conditions. Okay. And then a close-up of a very, very small element on this bone. It actually is a foramen, okay, a kutcha, okay. And that foramen actually is what's called a non-metric trait, and it's familially based, okay. So we could have been able to tell how related these individuals perhaps were to each other, just based on the frequency of, the frequency of some of these features, okay. So, CDO Conte, I would love to say a lot about it, okay. <laughs> Hopefully you have some questions about it, okay. I would love to know if you have any insights into it, okay. Uh, if it is indeed okay, in an area that's inundated by water, it's close to a sea beach, okay, the ocean beach. Okay. So I had looked up all of the data that I could on alkaline okay, effects okay, on the skeleton. Okay. And apparently seawater, of course it's changing now, but seawater is really slightly basic. Okay. And based on all kinds of information which has been accumulated in a lot of sites okay, that have slightly basic environments, okay, the skeleton's usually well preserved. Okay. So it makes me sort of move away if, you know, from thinking that way. Certainly doesn't seem to be highly acidic, again, based on the animal bones which are present at the site and are intact. Okay. They're not even, they're not even fragmentary, actually. Okay. So you got it, okay. you got me. Okay. Not sure what to do with it, okay. Uh, and maybe as sort of as the final word, for those of us doing archaeology today, we go for the very, very fine detail. They'd sample all the soils, okay. Because you can have a site or even a burial five feet away that's in a different microenvironment, okay, and may have a whole group of different circumstances that are affecting the skeleton. So having said that, okay, do you have any questions for me?